No, really. Good evening. Tonight's topic is trauma as it pertains to us in the streets. Um, and that's what hopefully we're going to discuss some some concepts. Like um, yeah, I don't usually go through all the introduction, but it's leading cause of death in young people. And we're going to talk about some of the different biometrics and different things that cause it. Um, we need to understand a small little physics to really understand trauma. Um, and physics deals with energy and the transfer of energy from one form to another. So here you see uh, you have all these different types of energy. But when you deal with trauma, usually we're dealing with mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is split into two. There is something called potential energy. This is the energy of something that is at rest. So a tree or a lamppost or even another vehicle that is at rest has potential energy. Potential means there's a possibility for it to have energy. But right now, it's at rest. The thing that causes most of the problems in trauma is the kinetic energy. And kinetic energy has a lot to do with speed and weight or mass of the object. But speed is definitely the most important thing. And just from common sense, right, people know that the faster the car was going, then the greater the injuries or the greater the damage, etc. That's all because of the law of kinetic energy. Um, chemical energy is energy being released from uh, a chemical reaction. So, for example, if you have a cold pack or a heat pack in your in your uh, kit, and you want to make some part of somebody's anatomy cold, and you don't carry bags of ice. So then you break the inner part of the cold pack, and that reacts with the other chemical. And um, that will be called an endothermic reaction, where energy will be removed and heat will be lost, and it will become a cold pack. And the same thing really works um, for heat packs. Um, and then there's electrical energy and other stuff, not really going to go into that much. So biomechanics is how um, things affect living organisms, such as humans. Um, and kinetics is all about physics. And it is very interesting. Obviously, on an EMT level, we try to keep it uh, pretty basic, but um, we can predict some sort of injury patterns based on the kinetics. Don't always have a lot of time on scene to start making chesplainers, but it's interesting to understand it, at least in a classroom setting. Um, different things that will affect the injuries will be position of the victim, okay? Where they are in relationship to the crash, um, the direction that they were traveling, did they hit a car going in the opposite direction? Did they hit a stationary object? So all these things will make a difference. Obviously, the energy that is transferred from one to another. You have to understand that Newton, Newton came up with three laws of physics. One of them is that we cannot create or destroy energy. Energy can just be transferred 
from one type of energy to another type of energy. But this, he said, uh, probably, I don't know, four or five hundred years ago, whenever he lived, um, he was a pretty famous physicist. And that's really what one of his laws of motion was that energy can only be transferred, cannot be created or destroyed. So it maybe it was potential, it was kinetic energy when it was moving and now becomes potential energy when it's at rest after hitting whatever it is. Different organs, different um, parts of the body. Uh, we have organs that we call that are filled with gas, right? Obviously, uh, the lungs would be a big one there. And I would include the GI tract, the intestines. These are more gas or hollow organs. And then we have uh, liquid containing organs, liver and spleen are two big ones like that. So here we have an MVA, a motor vehicle accident. Um, we always talk about the MOI. How did it happen? What exactly happened? And this can help us figure out what sort of injuries this patient may or may not have had. I always, I always tell people, if it was a T-bone injury to the passenger side, in this case, it's to the um, to the passenger side, right? But if it's to the driver's side, um, either way, the organ that is most susceptible here is actually anybody know T-bone injury. Which organ? Spleen. The spleen, very good. I have no idea who said that, but very good. So, yes, the spleen. Um, and uh, it's always something that you've got you to think about and you've got to watch out for. Um, so this is a little bit about kinetic energy. Uh, it's a half MV squared. Um, which means that the velocity, or the, let's say the speed, for want of simplicity, we square the speed, which means that if it's 100 miles per hour, then that's a 1,000, okay? That's the magnitude. If someone's going 10 miles an hour, 10 squared is 100. So... The velocity, which is the official word for speed, is the most important part here. Um, we're going to take the mass, the weight of the vehicle, and we're going to split that in half, multiply it by the velocity squared. So even if someone is doing 40 miles an hour, 40 times 40, is still going to be a huge amount of energy. Um, and then depending on the size of the truck or the car or whatever, you can understand why so much damage can be done based on the speed. And that's the whole thing with the, the New York Michigas to slow everybody down to 25 um, there is some seichel behind it, meaning there'll still be accidents and people will still do the wrong thing and people will still drive badly. It's not going to change any of that. What it will change is how bad the accident will be. Okay? How um, severe and obviously, we'll talk about the patient soon. Right now, we're just discussing the vehicle and vehicle damage and whatever. But obviously, that will affect the patient. And the lower the speed, so the speed you know, will be whatever, miles per hour, that number, when you square it, you times it by itself, 
um, will have direct impact on how much energy is being brought um, to the crash. So that's why it really makes a difference. And velocity has the, or speed, has the greatest effect uh, on the kinetic energy. So if anyone, you know, if anyone has any questions, I'll certainly answer them. Um, when the coin motion hits something else, it has to stop. And the energy has to be transferred to something else. And this picture is trying to show you uh, something called crumple zones. And the idea is that this part of the car will take the energy and transfer it into um, uh, potential energy uh, from kinetic energy. So this is a lot, you know, the way they build cars today, everything is with seichel, everything is thought out. Um, and hopefully the energy gets absorbed by the hood and everything that's in front of the car before it goes to the patient inside. Angle here means uh, things like, is it front impact or is it side impact? That's, that's really what it's talking about. And then seat belts. What sort of restraints do they have? Um, Understand also that if it's multiple vehicles traveling um, at the same time, the kinetic energy of both vehicles now has to be calculated and compensated for. So the crash will be even you know worse. Now, so here this is. Uh, this is Newton's law of energy that can be created or destroyed. Um, so the seat belts are going to help us. We're going to talk about it soon. Uh, how the kinetic energy from movement is transferred. Uh, here's Newton's first law of motion which is that a body will remain at rest or will remain moving unless acted on by an outside force. So I'm not sure why. It's just bringing them because we spoke about, you know, Newton's law of energy. So it brought Newton's first and second law. I guess just uh, not really... But but that law makes sense, right? That something will stay at rest, won't move unless a force acts on it. Um, so when people say, I was driving and, you know, the tree jumped out in front of me, um, not really, okay? The tree remains at rest. You hit the tree because of whatever reason it was, but... Newton's second law of motion is, is um, force equals mass times acceleration. Acceleration is a very complex concept in physics. Um, it's got nothing to do with the gas pedal, the accelerator. Acceleration is how fast you're changing velocity. How fast are you changing speed? So it's the time it takes to go from zero miles per hour to 100 miles per hour, Le Marshall, 
right? That would be acceleration, and that is multiplied by the mass, uh, the weight of the vehicle, whatever. Um, so that's force, if you anyone interested in what force is in, in physics. So the faster you slam on the brakes, right, and the short stops and all these things, makes a tremendous force because as the deceleration forces mass times either acceleration or deceleration. So the faster you slow down, the more force there's going to be. Um, G-force, I'm sure you've heard of that. G-force is gravity. So that's one of the ways that we measure um, force. Um, the most a human can tolerate is three times the normal normal G force. So, right. Which, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Okay. Um, Multi-system trauma means that it wasn't that somebody stumped that toe. Okay, that's just called toe trauma. Multi-system trauma is what happens with MVAs um, and you have to in inspect and assess the entire patient. Um, I had, I don't remember when things were, but it wasn't that long ago. Uh, a girl in high school hit by a, a car on Empire Boulevard um, and she went flying. Um, so, I actually have to ask my daughter for an update on how she's doing. But um, these are multi-system traumas. When people get hit, the car's going at speed. Uh, Empire always between Troy and Albany heading towards Albany, always issues because of the, the curvature, the hill, if you like. And, and people cross in the middle and they can't see cars that are flying, flying down Empire. So can be a problem. And then we have the geniuses that Cross Eastern Parkway in the middle of the block, uh, you know, and most of them are foreign, and most of them cannot judge the speed of the oncoming vehicle. Never clear your head. So, take home message cross at the lights. I thought in Crown Heights they, they cross on the lights. What do you mean on the lights? I saw some uh, kids hanging from the lights on the following lights. Oh, uh, yeah. That was my patient also. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get to that soon. Um, Blunt trauma, right? We don't know what blunt trauma is. So there's no gunshot wound. There's no stabbing. There's no, uh, usually no bleeding external. Um, blunt trauma. We see this in MVAs. Uh, pedestrian struck. Uh, we see it with motorcycle crashes. Uh, falls from heights like the... Uh, like the guy, yeah, Simchas uh, Beisheva, um, and a lot of sports injuries. Uh, you'll see blunt trauma. All right. 
I'll just go through this very quickly. I don't know if you know you need to know this, but there are five phases of trauma. So phase one is deceleration of the vehicle. Now, again, deceleration can mean that they hit the brakes or they didn't hit the brakes, but they decelerated because of hitting a lamppost, a stationary car, or a uh, wall. Um, so that's all to do with deceleration of the vehicles. That's number one. Remember, the vehicle will continue to move until all the kinetic energy has been lost. Um, not really lost, but dissipated. So it changes into the mechanical or the uh, uh, potential energy. Then there's deceleration of the occupant. So it will continue until the crash. So as the car breaks, the occupant in the car will also slow down, decelerate. But until the car actually stops, the occupant is going to continue moving. And then we've got things like um, seatbelts and, you know, where they are in the car. Um, then there's the internal organs. So just I'll just talk about the brain really quickly. The brain sits in, imagine the brain, that it's sitting, swimming in a beautiful pool of CSF. You're all familiar with CSF, right? Cerebral spinal fluid. And, and it's just sitting there, imagine it on a... Imagine on a flotation device or something, and it's happy. Brain is is in its CSF, and it's it's minding its own business or not, depending on whose brain we're talking about. But it's very content. All of a sudden, um, we get this. You can can you see on the picture where the brain? hits the skull. And that's really this says uh, phase three, the deceleration of the internal organs. Um, Steep belts don't really help with that. Um, so there can be many, many sort of injuries there. Phase four, secondary collisions. That's stuff flying around the car. Um, you may have a metal water bottle that's laying around that now got, became a projectile and hit somebody in the head. Uh, you understand? So that's what it means, secondary collisions. Phase five uh, will be um, another vehicle hitting that vehicle, let's say, because it went totally in the wrong direction, wrong lane, um, who knows what, or it got, the vehicle got deflected into a tree or into something else um, and further injury may be caused. So these are called the five phases of, uh, of MVAs of uh, Frontal, um, also known as head-on injuries. Um, so everything's moving forward. Kinetic energy, the deceleration, the force, everything's moving forward. The passengers are moving at the same rate as the car. And then what will happen? Well, it'll depend on the design of the car. Uh, what the car is made out of, and what safety features are available. Um, deceleration is really bad. Like it can, it can tear, uh, evolves body parts, organs, um, and you may not see it 
during examination. Some common uh, head-on injury impacts here. Um, definitely the head is something that you've got to worry about. Um, the brain smashing against the skull. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely be wary of that bleeding, you know, from the brain, uh, tearing. And you may not see anything on your physical exam. Just putting it out there. Uh, aorta, the most common um, place, uh, site of deceleration injuries in the chest. Uh, it can be torn away. Uh, if the aorta gets torn, there can be complete blood loss um, and immediate death. Uh, so aorta, aorta injuries are, are really serious. Um, so when there is a Head on impact, the driver can typically do one of two things. And it's called down and under or up and over. That's what they're called. Uh, down and under, the knees typically strike the dashboard, uh, steering column, and um, there can be all sorts of injuries to the femurs, the pelvis, uh, you name it, there can be injuries. Um, sorry. Up and over is where the, let's say here the picture, the driver is going to go over the steering wheel. Um, and here you see, can you see my screen? Can you see this, how the knee impacts with the dashboard and then energy is transferred to the pelvic area here? And this is why, even though the pelvis was not necessarily involved, but they can now have hip pelvic fractures femur fractures, all sorts of stuff. So it, it is useful to know which direction uh, the patient went. Uh, if we deal with up and over, then we're very concerned about the head obviously hitting the, um, the windshield. Um, so the main point is going to be the head. Um, there can still be lower leg uh, injuries, and even abdominal injuries. They can be ejected from the car through the windshield if they're not wearing proper restraint. Lateral side impacts. I Rib, ribs. Is, I had a few times ribs, fractured ribs uh, from the from the impact of the of the. Um... The airbag. The, air, the, air, the airbag, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that can happen too, correct. Um, lateral impact or side impact, uh, I told you, you have to worry about spleen. Uh, always, always concern yourself with the patient with the spleen. Um, I, I've got stories of a patient that I went to six days later that some of the responders thought the patient was having chest pain um, and it turned out they weren't and when I really palpated and examined um, certainly I found out that it was a splenic rupture this was six days later and they are made on the scene they refused attention um, because they were fine and they had a small bleed from the spleen, uh, which presented with what people thought was chest pain. 
I didn't, but um, and that was a life saved um, because we realized what had happened and we got the whole story, but no one thought, like, who would ask somebody with chest pain if they were in a car accident that week? It doesn't even make sense. But I did because it wasn't chest pain. It was spleen. And we saved this guy's life. There's no question about it. Uh, definitely, they can be rib, um, rib injuries, 100%. I mean, it can be anything. Anything can be injured with, uh, you know, with this type of lateral uh, um, impact. Uh, Yo, could you talk a little bit about the call on Simchatev Sheva as a case study? Yeah, I'll get to it. Patient that's on. Yeah, I'll get to it. Let me just see when when is a good time. Rear impact. Um, so you can have whiplash injuries, as it says there. Um, the energy is transferred to the front of the vehicle from the back, and there's a chance of survival here more than any of the others. This is quarter panel. Um, off center, you know, uh, so a lot of damage to patients. Um, rollovers, rollovers are like the worst. Okay, if you've ever been to rollover injuries, these are usually the worst. Um, I think it's like 90% chance of death over any other type of injury is a rollover injury. So seat belts. Okay. Um I'm very I'm very back to make sure everybody in the car when I drive is wearing a seat belt, except for me. But I'm very uh, very strict about it. They save lives, there's no question about it. Uh they do prevent ejection. As it says there, um, and even just the occupants bashing into one another, um, so they're they're very good. Airbags. This is a burn from the chemicals in an airbag, um, and remember, small children should not be seated in the front seat of a vehicle. Okay. Should not be in the front seat. Motorcycle crashes. I mean, I call motorcycle uh, riders um, organ uh, donor. So the fact that they ride them, it just means that they're waiting to become an organ donor. But they're very dangerous. I'm not a fan. Helmet, remember, you probably did it in your schooling, in your class. Helmet removal should be careful. Um, obviously, you can't deal with the airway properly if they're wearing a helmet. So make sure you don't let the neck snap back when you remove it. Pedestrian injuries. Um, so one thing I like to talk about with pedestrian injuries uh, the difference between adults and children, okay? When a child gets hit by a car, so, so the child, depending on the age, obviously, will get hit in the abdomen, the chest, or the head. Um, typically, adults will get hit in the say pelvis and down femurs lower legs so it does make a difference it makes a huge difference um, when it comes when it comes to the size of the patient okay it will make a huge difference so 
that's the first impact or second? All right, so I just got an update about the, the girl that got hit by by a car. She was she was in tenth grade last year, and my daughter just told me that she broke a collarbone or clavicle, and she a hundred percent back to school, back to normal. Now it was quite a hard recovery and everything. Um, and she she really got whacked by a car going fast. Um, so I just you know, there's uh, my daughter said she's a lucky, lucky girl. <laughs> so that was her her words. Um, so first impact is the vehicle hits the pedestrian, then. The uh, adult, as it says here, is thrown onto the hood or the grill of the vehicle. Again, child would be different. And the third impact is the body hitting the ground. Here we have to be very concerned about children because when they hit the ground, it's gonna it's gonna be head first. So that's pretty bad. And here's a picture of um, looks like three different looks like children. Um, but okay, falls from heights. So I'll tell you what happened since Ve uh there was two Bachrim that decided to climb all the way up the street, the uh, traffic light, and to go all the way to the end, and then to come back. One of them, the younger one, jumped down and had a pretty safe landing. And the one that made fame um fell from the traffic light so he was definitely over 20 20 feet high um he fell and um he was unresponsive when we got there we we got there and we loaded him quickly onto a stretcher and we got him to a trauma center. Um, he did very well. Um, he started to come around. Uh, he was intubated and nobody really knew because he was unresponsive. So we didn't really know what the injuries were. Uh, multiple x-rays were taken and it turned out that that literally all he had was a broken a wrist um, and somehow he managed to land on his arm 
and uh, he had no head injuries and he had no leg or femur injuries that one would expect um and he was uh, he was on a plane the next morning so this happened this happened at like two three o'clock in the morning and then he was in hospital and i think was it one day later he was on a plane back to california back to l.a uh, with a broken wrist uh, and completely responsive and everything back to normal. There were no bleeds, no brain bleeds, which is what we were extremely concerned about. And no particular broken limbs, uh, except for that arm. So that's if, what happened. If all he broke was his wrist and he didn't have a head injury, then why did he pass out? Right. So what we decided was that he was drunk. Um, he must have had a large amount of alcohol. Yeah, and why the need to intubate? What was his respiration like that he felt the need to intubate? Um, well, we're concerned about not the respirations, but managing the airway. When somebody is that unresponsive, there's no way to know if they're going to be able to maintain a patent airway. Well, like as a precaution, he did it just in case of called social aid, basically. Yeah, in case he was not able to maintain an airway. But his vitals were unremarkable, the regular pulse and, and breathing. Yeah, and pretty pressure. much. Pretty much vitals were pretty unremarkable. Lucky man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it gave him fluids in case there was internal bleeding, you know. Um, but really it was just the wrist, yeah. Forearm. Um, so yeah, he, he was, he was, he was very lucky and, uh, he had a miracle. say again, basically he had a miracle. Yes, yes, yes. He, you know, we've still got to say it as it is. He did a really stupid thing. Um, and let's not, let's not, um, downplay, um, that it was not a smart thing to do. Um, but he had a miracle, yeah. So penetrating trauma, all that was called blunt trauma. Penetrating trauma is where we deal with gunshot wounds, stabbings, um any flying sharp edges or whatever through the body. Um, leading source of penetrating injuries of firearms. Uh, when people get stabbed, right? So number one, do not remove it. Do not remove it, okay? Unless it's blocking the airway sort of from the neck or the cheek, and the airway is going to be blocked. Otherwise, leave it in, pat it, um, and stabilize it so it doesn't move. Um, there are so many things, but you need x-rays. You need to see what's going on. Is it in the chest? Where are the lungs? Did it hit a lung? You know, I mean, it's just endless, uh, the possibilities. Um, A lot of this doesn't make any sense um, if you, you know, because we're coming EMS, right? So it's impossible to know um, a lot of this stuff. So the type of firearm does not make a difference, really. 
Um, it makes a difference if it's a shotgun or if it's a nine millimeter, but that's all the met like that's really all that will make a difference. Velocity of the projectile is no way you're gonna know because every single manufacturer, every single gun is slightly different. Um, design or size of the projectile again, it's a shotgun, it's going to be a huge um, hole. And if it's a nine millimeter, they're actually very small, the entrance wounds. Distance of victim from the muzzle, muzzle is the end of the gun. Um, yeah, it would make a difference, a point blank, or if it, you know, it's at a distance, but it can still cause, even at 15 or 20 feet, it's still going to cause a lot of damage. Oh, uh, here it says shotguns, rifles, handguns, right? A revolver and a pistol are pretty much the same. Just um, revolver will have less rounds than a pistol. A uh, pistol can have, you know, anything up to 20 rounds. So the most important factor will be what did it hit? What type of tissue? What did it, you know, um, stuff like that. Where, what did it, where was the injury? Um, I don't know, not, not going to talk about cavitation right now. Let's talk about exit wounds. So if somebody does get shot, um, it's very important that we look for the entry and the exit wound. Okay, and this is, um, this was a case with uh, Yanko Rosenbaum. I think they missed the exit wound. So exit wounds are larger typically than entry wounds and got to find them. Now, it's not 100% there'll be an exit wound. So I've seen many people that have been shot and there was no exit wound because the bullet got lodged in a rib or even in a organ inside. So all these things are, are possibilities, um, but uh, it's you've got to look. You've got to look for the exit wound. Um, very important. Um, again, you're not going to spend time trying to figure out, you know, which bullet they used and then and which type of weapon. It won't make a difference. I own many guns, and it just they're all the same when it comes to um, stuff like that. Doesn't matter. Secondary blast, um, that flying debris and stuff that you know from a. Okay, there's lots of blast injuries. It goes up to like six or something, whatever, like lots of them uh, here. So this shows the different, right, the primary blast, which is the actual explosion or whatever, and then you have all these other um, blast injuries that can occur. Tissues at risk um, with a blast, so you have um, organs that contain air. Okay, are uh, definitely susceptible. So the ear, heart, lungs, major blood vessels, these are uh, definitely um, be a problem. Uh, they can have ringing in the ears, pain in the ears, even bleeding from the ears. 
So, yeah, blast injuries really can very, very loud. Even gunshots. I wonder how many of you have actually heard live gunshots. They're very loud. Um, if you're right near them. Um, so, they're very, very loud. Um, I wear two oh, yeah. feet of, of ear protection when I'm shooting at a range because it's so loud and my hearing is very important. I'm sounds and hearts and the stuff that I do, so I really don't want to have hearing problems. Baruch um, my hearing is, is perfect. I don't hear my wife or kids, um, but it's uh, I'm good at hearing uh, lung sounds. Elio, we're sucking chest wound holding now. Is it three, is it four? We keep on jumping back over the years, um, bandaging it. Do you make that pop valve or not? So it's like this now. You seal all four sides. If you see that they are struggling to breathe and you have no medics, open it up. Open the bottom corner. That's really it. Generally speaking, it's four. Yeah. Yeah, generally you're going to put four, but you'll see sometimes the breathing is going to get worse. So, so readjust it. All right. Well, so forget for it. Uh, open it. But sorry. Yeah, just open it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's after you pack. That's, that's after you pack the ones. No, you got to pack the sucking chest wound. Oh, sucking. I thought it was a bullet. Okay. No. Um, um, I, I had yesterday a stab wound to the back, to the lungs. We put the occlusive dressing, but right away came off due to the bleeding. Such a case, what am I supposed to do? So first deal, first deal with the bleeding. Stop the bleeding and then put on the occlusive dressing. The the patient was in in traumatic arrest. We had to do CPR in the meantime. It was oh, like... so then so then forget about the occlusive dressing. Then we just do we just like, do CPR and do CPR. CPR, yeah. Well, if he's bleeding out, don't don't you deal with bleeding first when it's um. Uh... It's very, usually it's minimal bleeding from the chest and lung area, usually. Ask, ask the person that said that they, they were at the traumatic arrest. How much it bleeding was, was there? It was a lot of blood, but it, he wouldn't be bleeding out. Like the ambulance was full of blood, but not, not that bad that it would be like bleeding out. Right. You can also put a piece of gauze and a piece of tape over it if you're really worried. Listen, traumatic arrest, they don't they don't get resuscitated. You know, it just it's just one of those things that they almost never make it. Yeah, they called him right away when we got to the ER. Yeah. Here, so here, just to, this is exactly what you were talking about or somebody else said. Um, there's a course that medics take that I teach called PHTLS, Pre-Hospital Trauma Life Saving, okay? It's called PHTLS. Um, one of the things they changed was instead of A, B, C, D, E, that now they do X, A, B, C, D, E. Okay? What's shot X? X is for exsanguination, which means major blood loss. If you have, yes, if you have major blood loss, you will deal with it before even ABCs. 
But this is usually when the patient is still alive. Okay? But this is the X for, it's a big word, exsanguination. I gave this lecture to a group of medics, and one guy tells me exsanguination starts with an E. I told him he went to the wrong yeshiva <laughs> because in, in PHTLS, yeshiva's PD, PHTLS starts with an X. So anyway, the same, one, the same ones that spell that spell pneumonia with an N. Yeah, exactly. He is in pneumonia. Anyway, in breathing, obviously the normal. This is the, your your um, primary survey uh, circulation. Right, obviously we gotta do CPR. You do CPR. D is GCS pupil. And E is exposed for, uh, you know, look for life threats, look for other stuff. Transport decision always, trauma center, right? We always want to go to a trauma center in New York. We have plenty of them. Platinum, 10 minutes. So, so we noted that with that call, and you have to understand, there were thousands of people um, in our way by that call, by some Um We had to get the stretcher into a place where the ambulance was uh, half a block away. And we had to wheel it in with our equipment, got him on the stretcher, got him out, got him into the bus. Um, removed clothing, did what we did, and we were 21 minutes from the call until we were at the trauma center with that notification. So um, we had things that we had to deal with, meaning scene problems. There were barricades that we couldn't get through. And there were so many people pushing against the barricades that we couldn't release them and all sorts of, you know, problems that were pertaining to that call. But we still managed 21 minutes from the call until we got to the bay of the hospital. So, yeah, you've got to move. Sample, obviously, if you can, if the patient is conscious, do we have an isolated injury? Um, that's like stubbing your toe or cutting your finger with a with a sharp knife. Or do you have a multi-system trauma, such as, you know, that patient falling from the traffic lights. Um, obviously, full set of vital signs, cardiac monitoring. We did all, all that stuff. Uh, most A lot of it on route. And head to toe exam, we also did on route while we were moving. Um, head and neck. Um, so that's a whole separate lecture about head and neck and collar, no collar. It's it's a big debate now in medicine. Um wow, the whole thing with the collar trying to trying to lessen it more and more. That makes sense, lessen it more and more. I don't even know if that makes sense. But we're definitely trying to minimize the use of the collar. Um, primary survey, which has now got the X in front of it. Um, trauma score, it's not used so much. We usually use GCS. Uh, trauma score is GCS with all these other things. Uh, it's 1 to 16, if I remember rightly, and I think the EPCRs do it for you. GCS was invented in uh, in a town in Scotland called Glasgow, and really it was only made for drunk Scotsmen to see how 
bad their head injuries were and what their chances of survival would be. Today it's used across the board. Remember, you cannot get a score of less than three. Even if you be dead, you're still looking at three to 12. Um, um, on the GCS, yeah, sorry, three to 15. Uh, this is the trauma score, which I'm probably not going to use. Very complicated. Um, management of trauma. Well, then you've got to worry about spinal stuff, um, fluids. You guys can't do that unless there's any medics on tonight. Uh, here. So this is called the lethal triad. You may never have been taught this. They don't teach this to EMTs. Um, but Sa these saline are... Or, saline or ringer? Or plasma? Saline. Um, this is the lethal triad. Okay? So one thing that is really important for EMTs to know is hypothermia. <laughs> So even if they're mildly hypothermic, they have a lower survival rate than normal thermic. So it makes a good impression. But uh, yeah. I think at 28, I should have to have the Please mute yourselves. Please mute yourselves. All yeah. right. I I hear people talking. It's a little annoying. So how many frags? Is he achieving a full day or is he doing a class in the middle or um if you if you're concerned of hypothermia, then the, my question is always and medics are or my, and medics are always giving saline or ring or whatever they're giving. The liquid they're giving is usually what seventy degrees, eighty degrees, and that's not doing any damage. No, seventy, eighty degrees is is very good. But why? If it's a, if the if the temperature of the body is ninety eight, ninety eight, ninety ninety eight degrees, we well, shouldn't it be closer to the temperature of the body when you're giving those those fluids. It can be cold. I'll tell you what happened. My sister of this job was, I wanted to give a 90 something year old lady a bag of fluid. And I asked them to bring me from the bus a bag of fluid. And I came in and I said, Is it warm? Because we have a warmer on the bus. So it's nice and you know, warm the fluid. And I felt it and it was cold. The lady said, uh, yeah, that I told them to take the bag of fluid and go to the kitchen, put it in the microwave. Microwave. Yeah. And warm yes. it up. So it well, just has to be no chill. Okay. It can't be chilled. As long as it's, package, you, know, you know, not 40, you want to 40, 50, 60 degrees, that's, like you had a, yeah. that's cold. Yeah, okay? that's right. Right. As long as it's over there, you're you're mm -hmm. you're fine. So hypothermia refers to just really keeping them covered, keeping the 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 heat on in the bus. Even if you're hot, it doesn't matter, right? I was on a call yesterday. The the my backup um, backup medic tells me put on the air conditioner. I said why? The patient is hot. He said, no, I'm hot. I said, nobody cares. Nobody cares about you. You're in the back of a bus. We care about a patient. That's it. So if you're hot, take off your clothes. We're not putting on the air conditioner for you unless the, the patient was unresponsive. So how do I know what the patient was, hot or cold or whatever? So you have to take all these things into consideration. Um, acidosis is not something that EMTs really deal with. Um, but, but kept asking me about it. CME, but it's starting to be a lot of fun. He's a very dry teacher, instructor.
Okay, um, acidosis. So the easiest way for me to explain that is if somebody has too much CO2, let's say they're just not breathing right for whatever reason, or a million other reasons they could be acidotic. But one simple way to think about acidosis, they have too much CO2. Too much. They're holding in their breaths. They're not exhaling properly, so they're not blowing off enough CO2. That's one way you could think of it. Um, now, coagulopathy is probably the most complex of these three things. Um, if something is preventing clotting, this will cause greater blood loss. So... So by giving the person fluid, isn't why wouldn't that cause... Um, why wouldn't that allow the clotting process not to... Um... Right, so that's a whole difference today from the way it was 20-something years ago. And today, we don't give patients six liters of fluid because what well, exactly that's what we were doing. We were preventing blood clotting by diluting the blood. So today, it's very, very different and we want something called permissive hypo, um, permissive hypotension, where we only want the systolic blood pressure at 90. And once we maintain that, then we stop the fluids. So it's not like when I became a medic and everything was very different. So this is just the lethal triad, the three things that make trauma very, very um, um, dangerous. Um, you are um, you are very correct in saying that too much fluid will be a problem for coagulopathy, and you're right. 100% it is, and that's why we limit it. We do not give like we used to. Um, Isn't that the reason why Ringer is better for that? Because Ringer has the no, ingredients that. No, no. All it has is some more electrolytes. It won't make any difference. Ringer's is good for uh, abdominal pains and and uh, vomiting and things like that. Won't won't make any difference in trauma. Uh, trauma center. Right, this is when we should be going. I think most of you will know that. Falls of more than 20 feet for adults or 10. Um, we usually go with 10 feet or three times the height. Okay, so everything else I think people are familiar with when to go to a trauma center. Um, You left out one thing, there's blood thinners. Yeah, well, if someone's on blood thinners, then, you know, it's it's going to be a bigger problem. Um, even a small trauma, mm -hmm. a minor trauma, a bump of the head, let's say, that patient goes in and has to get scanned. Um, never take a chance on a patient with, uh, you know, who's taking blood thinners. Never want to take that chance. Um, trauma center criteria, whatever. I mean, I think we're pretty good with that. Um, different trauma centers, level one, mm -hmm. level two. I'm not going into all that tonight. Choppers, we don't use in New York City, but if any of you are in uh, the... 
Catskill region. I'm not sure what goes on in Jersey, but we definitely L Lakewood. It's once every two days. They were Lakewood. It's once every two days. Okay, and in the Catskills, we use them uh, quite a lot, also. So, but there are there are reasons not to use them. Um, if it's just as fast to go by ground and go by ground, uh, there are many reasons not to. I don't want to go into it all. Uh, it depends on the the distance, uh, obviously, and the weather. Weather is a big deal. I noticed in the castles they won't go in bad in bad weather. Um, all right, this is the last slide. It talks about this new drug called TXA. It is used by medics in, I think, in Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not have it in New York. Um, and it's it's a massive, massive machloikas amongst the poskim right now, whether it's good or bad. Uh, it can be used for postpartum hemorrhage. If you have it, we don't, we don't have it. Uh, it's used in the military um, for uh, for bleeding, um, and uh, it's it's definitely up for discussion. Um, nobody knows. Nobody knows if you should use it, shouldn't use it. Um, definitely, um, the mass pants or the pneumatic anti shock garments have gone out of flavor in New York State. Uh, tourniquet is big time being used. So so are hemostatic dressings in places where you cannot use a tourniquet. And um, TXA is is up for debate. Up for debate. There is no. There is no. Uh, every place is doing really their own thing with it. So I think is using it. 